Hi everyone, uh, my name is Hamed Rezaei. I'm going to present my most recent work, Superways, a data center topology for in-cast heavy uh, workloads. I am thrilled to present this paper because WWW is the primary venue for web applications and our work is geared toward the most critical web applications such as Google Search, Microsoft Bing, and many other social networks such as uh, Facebook and Twitter. So let's dive into the problem and see what problem we are trying to solve. We are trying to solve the incast problem in data center networks. So what is the incast? Incast happens in data center networks when multiple servers send their data to a single server simultaneously. So you see a figure on the right. Uh, the receiver is denoted by R and we have four servers that are denoted by S1, S2, S3, and S4. So incast happens when a server sends a query to multiple servers. This server is denoted by R, the server that sends the query. And in the next step, the query servers send their reply to the querying server simultaneously, those servers that are denoted by S1, S2, S3, and S4. So these, uh, you can see the, the data path of all these servers to the receiver. And you can see the problem here at the last hop switch that is connected to the receiver, the buffer will, will overflow because the aggregated rate of uh, the the, aggre the aggregated rate of traffic that is going through the receiver uh, is much much higher than the link that is connected into this to the server from the lift switch from the last hop lift switch. This uh, phenomenon is pretty common in modern data center networks like Google Search and Microsoft Bing. And incast is always is in in most of the times the packets need the, these incast related packets are very short flows. We will talk about that later. As we mentioned earlier, incast leads to long queues at the last hop switch that is connected to the receiver or the server that the sends that sends the queries, and therefore we will see a lot of uh, packet drops. So let's let's take a take a closer look at incast interarrival time and also. A flow size distribution. Uh, there was a paper published in IMC 17 that reveals that about 50% of the incasts arrive within 100 microseconds from the previous incast. Thus, uh, detecting incasts accurately and timely detecting incasts is really difficult, and almost no congestion control is able to detect incasts in such a short window. And also, as we as we uh, actually mentioned earlier, incast leads to excessive uh, packet drops. There was another paper uh, published in SICOM 18 that reveals that 70% of the flows have only one packet to send. So this means state art, um, the state of the art reactive congestion controls like HOMA is insufficient to solve incast. You see a figure on the right. The left-hand side figure shows the performance of HOMA in presence of incast, but when the flows are larger than 10 kilobytes. And the right-hand side figure shows the, the performance of HOMA when flows have only one packet in presence of incast. You see how the performance of HOMA drops if we have extremely small flows in presence of incast. Also, uh, packet prioritization does not work because prioritization is usually based on a flow size when all the flows have the same size, so there is no way to prioritize some flows over the others. Thus, the solution is creating a heterogeneous topology. We have to solve the problem at the underlying topology by uh, co-locating incast aggregators and then providing more links or bandwidth for these incast servers. So we actually say that this problem had, has to be solved at the hardware level. So what is our key insight? The key insight is a number of incast aggregators, those servers that collect the queries from other servers is much, much less than the number of workers or those servers that just participate in incast. They send their data, they, re they actually reply to the queries, but they do not collect the servers. Um, I mean, collect the uh, replies. And also incast aggregators are network bound. They are not CPU bound. We will talk about that later in next slide. So we talk about network and CPU, but what about memory and uh, uh, actually storage? Incast aggregators collect just very small portion of data or replies. So there will be no contention for memory and storage. But for CPU, you might say, okay, how do you know the, it is, uh, you know, you may say how they are not CPU bound. So 
we can say, you know, worker servers do the heavy lifting work of looking up the query in the local database. So they are CPU bound, but they, are, they will not be uh, network bound. I'm talking about the worker servers. So the worker servers are CPU bound, but they are not network bound. But in case aggregators, as we see here, are network bound. But let's take a look at the real uh, experiment. We implemented Apache Solar, which is an open source web, I mean, text indexing server uh, in a Cloud Lab environment. And we simulated a real data center there. And we measured the network utilization of the uh, Apache Solar, which plays the role of NCAS aggregator in our scenario. We can see that uh, the um, network utilization, network bandwidth utilization for that server is 68%, while that number for a non incast application, I mean, a worker server that, that does not uh, uh, collect the replies is only 22%. So this experiment shows that, you know, incast aggregators are indeed network bound. So what is the whole idea? The idea is creating a heterogeneous topology by bin packing in gas aggregators on specific servers and then providing more bandwidth or links for those servers. What are the steps? The first step is to sort aggregators based on their in degree and then start installing the aggregator with highest in degree on one of the servers. Then we use the leftover capacity optimally for other in aggregators. How do we do that optimally? This is a very well-known problem, classic knapsack problem. Let's take a, a closer look at our design by uh, talking about two scenarios. Let's say uh, we have three in aggregators with different in degrees, five, four, and two. And we have one elected physical server that is gonna host the um, in cast applications. The bandwidth usage at the, at the initial stages is zero and the leftover capacity is C, which is the total capacity of the link. We place the first in cast aggregator on the server, then the leftover capacity updates. It's C minus B1 now. Let's see, assume the leftover capacity is enough for installing the next in cast application. So we do place the next in cast application on the server and the leftover capacity will be updated again. Let's imagine still we have enough capacity to uh, place the next in-cast application. We do that and leftover capacity updates accordingly. But uh, let's say the scenario is, is a little bit different. Uh, we place the first in-cast aggregator on the server and then we assume that the leftover capacity is very small so that there is no more capacity for the next in-cast application on this physical server. What we do, we place the next in-cast application on the server, but we provide one, uh, one more link for the server and we connect that link to this point switch. So now the leftover capacity updates, it's two uh, multiplied by C minus B1 minus B2. So let's imagine there is, uh, we have some restrictions. So uh, we can, mm, I mean, the leftover capacity of the all links combined, the one, the, the initial link and the one that we added is not enough to um, absorb all packets of the next in cast aggregator. So what we do, we place that in cast aggregator on the other server, other, um, I mean, physical server, and we update the leftover capacity. Now our focus is gonna be on the next server. So the leftover capacity will be C minus P3. But you might say why you didn't add the server, uh, I mean the incast application on the previous server and why we did not add another link uh, for that server. This is a design decision. If your server is able to I mean, in terms of uh, storage, memory and CPU, if your server is still able to uh, host that application, then we can do that. If it is not, then you have to go to another server like what we did right now. So now let's imagine uh, the leftover capacity is enough. Uh, I mean, we added one link for the first physical server and now the leftover capacity is enough and we have, um, and we are, uh, I mean, the, the server is, is powerful enough in terms of memory, storage, and CPU to host the next in-cast application. So what we do, we just simply add it to the uh, previous server that we have, and then the leftover capacity will be updated to multiplied by C minus B1 minus B2 and minus B3. So the whole topology will look like this after adding the extra link. So you see one figure on the left, which basically shows you 
uh, how the topology will look like after adding the extra links. So as you can see, only one portion of the, the data center will be uh, hosting these in-cast applications and only that part of the topology will have extra links. So you do not need to add all these extra links in, 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 you know, in all the data center network, but only one part of it. So uh, why Superways is implementable? Um, number of in-cast aggregators is small. This is something that we mentioned at the beginning. We did an, an, an analysis on publicly available Facebook data set and we observed that between three to 5% of all servers are possibly in cache aggregators. So this is a quite a small number, three to 5% is almost nothing. And modern data center applications are containerized. It is easy to move these applications around and workload does not change frequently. So we do not need to relocate applications frequently. Um, okay, let's talk about the methodology. We implemented Superways in two different environments, first simulations and then a real test bed. In NS3, we simulated 400 servers with 10 spine switches and 20 leaf switches. And we repeated the experiment in a real test bed with 16 servers, two spine switches and four leaf switches. So we compared uh, three different, uh, actually four different schemes. The first one is leaf spine that we talked about. The next one is jellyfish which basically suggests a random graph topology rather than a tree topology. Uh, and then we compared with BQ, which basically adds one extra link between all servers and spine switches. And subways, which adds extra link between all servers and leaf switches, which this link could be inter or intra cluster. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the uh, tail, um, I mean, let's talk about the results. First, tail, tail flow completion time. As you can see in this figure, um, we implemented superways on top of uh, leaf spine, B cube, jellyfish, and subways. And uh, the um, y axis shows the, under, for the right hand side figure, shows the tail of city, and the um, x axis shows the load in terms of percentage. You can see we get 95% reduction in tail of city on average for all topologies, which is a great, great improvement. We get the same number for throughput, but a little bit lower, like 25% improvement in throughput on average for all topologies when we implement super, uh, super ways on top of these topologies. So uh, what about cost, which is the most important metric in terms of changing the, the topologies? So um, for the left-hand side figure, the x-axis shows the uh, cost. Uh, the the x-axis actually shows the uh, shows superways when three percent, four percent, and five percent of the whole servers are in cast applications, and the y-axis shows the cost in terms of thousand dollars. So and we have the same thing for the right-hand side figure, but the x-axis in the right hand side figure shows the number of extra links that we need for and that we need to add for each server if we place in cast applications on them. So we see that Superways is nine times cheaper than Subways on average, even if we have like uh, five, even if 5% of the whole servers are in cast applications, which is a huge difference. And it's much, much cheaper than Subways, which is the most recent data center topology. So, and this figure actually shows the performance of uh, Superways in the real test bed, the cloud lab environment that I mentioned earlier. So as you can see here, the, the results that we got from the test bed are really close to the result that we got in the simulations. And it means that the Superways uh, is actually, uh, the Superways performance remains strong even in, uh, it, it, you know, uh, even in the real environments. So Superways is the, uh, so basically, you know, uh, Superways, I mean, we believe that Superways achieves a better trade-off between cost and performance in critical applications such as web search and Superways will be the uh, topology uh, for hosting those, uh, mm, I mean, will be the topology for those, that, for those data centers that host uh, in-cast heavy workloads. Thank you so much for listening. I would be so happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of this talk. Thank you.